Hi, and welcome to yet another episode of Cash Power BI. Today, we have something very special. Today, we're going to talk about the history of Power BI, the history of BI at Microsoft. And for that, we have someone who was there since the beginning. We're going to talk to Amir Nats, technical fellow at Microsoft, visionary of the Microsoft BI products. And we're going to talk about the beginning. How did we get started? We came from the multidimensional world. How did we transition to the self-service market with Power BI, uh, with Power Pivot? And how did we go from Power Pivot to Power BI? And what is the journey that we're had? And where are we going to go from here? So this is going to be very exciting. I'm super happy to have him here. So with that, let's go to the episode. So hi, Amir. I'm very honored to have you here on the show and to talk about the rise of BI at Microsoft. And of course, as a founding father of Power BI, talk about Power BI. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit about yourself and what you do with the company today. Sure. Uh, so I am a technical fellow at Microsoft. I've been with the company now for almost 25 years, and I'm the CTO of Power BI. And I would say that it's just uh, fitting because I've been doing BI throughout so many years at Microsoft, virtually all these years, Microsoft was all about BI, uh, and even before Microsoft. Yeah. So maybe we can start about that because you're one of the founding fathers of BI at Microsoft. Uh, so how did it all start? And where did you start? Well, I, if you want to go where I started, I started at the age of 10. I actually wrote my first program in Fortran on a mainframe in the university using punch cards. I don't know if people know, there was a period before computers even had screens. And the only way you can actually write the programs was to you know, use keyboard that would punch uh, cardboard cards with the uh, with the with the code that you write, and then you run those pack of cards in the computer, and there will be a printout out. There were no screens or anything like it. So that was my, me at the age of ten. That's how I started. If you really really want to go backwards, yeah, of uh, course. At the age of fourteen, I was doing adult classes in programming. At the age of uh, uh, sixteen, I had my own business. Uh, and then I, when I finished my military service in Israel, I joined as a first employee in a new startup. Uh, and that startup was, uh, became Panorama Software. And that startup was, you know, after a weird journey, uh, found itself building uh, BI systems. And that's the one that uh, Microsoft acquired in 1996. Uh, so, that's how I go to Microsoft. Uh, so uh, it was a really a, an amazing journey. Um, and when I joined Microsoft, we were there to we were you know, there for to build uh, the Olaf server for Microsoft. We were part of the SQL Server group, and uh, it was called Olaf Services, and then it was changed to Analysis Services, and uh, and. Then we have a whole history of what happened next in Microsoft because it's a lot of time, it's a couple of decades, right? So, um, right. so that's still how we got here. So, yeah. so even even in the beginning, you were involved with the OLAP engine, right? But the early days, it was obviously not the tabular and the DAX engine as we know it today, but it was a multidimensional engine. So, did you did it come with the acquisition? Did you already have some sort of a multidimensional engine, or are you? But you, but you were there from the beginning, right? Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, so people who are not familiar with the multidimensional engine, uh, you have to understand how we go to the multidimensional engine. We did not invent it, uh, the concept. Uh, but when I was just starting with this in Panorama, one of the most amazing demos I've seen was a demo of, of, a, of an EIS system, executive information system, where the demoer, uh, was slicing and dicing data in a speed that I could not fathom. I just could look, I was looking at the demo and said, I don't understand, he's, he's working on so much data. And we're talking now, the year was probably 1994. We're talking like a long, long time ago and computers were, you know, as fraction of the, of the power that they have today. Uh, and, and it was just flying with lots of data. And I thought it was magic. I thought, I don't understand how this can be done. And, so I went home and you know went to sleep on it, really, really traveled, woke up in the morning and said, I get it. He's cheating. 
he actually knows all the answer in advance. He's pre-computing the answer in advance. And so when the query is coming, he already just pulls out the pre-computed answers. And really that's what multidimensional MOLAP is, or MOLAP is, okay. is the idea that if you, def if you have a well-defined dimensionality of the data, you can actually pre-compute the aggregates of the data uh, in advance. So when the queries are coming, you are, you know, we are going to uh, uh, know the answers and instead of having to scan all the data, we'll just pull out the aggregates and compute them. So that was the, the origin of how we got to multidimension. Of course, anybody who, you know, does a little bit, you know, two steps ahead realizes there is a fundamental problem with this concept. And the fundamental problem with the concept is that you have to basically compute all the permutations of every possible question that anybody can ask. So all of systems at a time were highly limited on the number of dimensions it could have because of that, you know, a factorial explosion of the combinations of questions that people could ask. So most systems yeah. could do eight dimensions, nine dimensions. That's about it, right? It was almost nothing. Uh, but it's still really, you know, really magical, even with those very little dimensions. So people would build all sorts of sub, you know, a cube with eight dimension of this combination, eight dimension of the other combination, and so forth. That's kind of how the whole system worked. And one of the ideas I had at the time was an idea that says, you know, what if we don't compute all the, all the permutations? And what if we compute just a subset that will allow us to compute the rest on the fly? So we use one aggregate that is more detailed to compute the other, another aggregate that is less detailed by rolling it up on the fly. And if we're just very smart in how we select which aggregates to compute and which not to compute, we can actually get much higher dimensionality supported. And that was really the algorithm that was at the heart of the first OLAP system that we, we, did, uh, we, we built at Panorama. And I think that's what Microsoft really liked about what they saw when we, they, they met us and talked about us because they realized that we can actually scale to a much, much higher dimensionality. And in fact, that then we, we had this demo that you can maybe still find images of it um, on the, on the on the internet today, uh, where we show how you design which aggregations uh, are going to be computed in the cube, and there's a trade-off between the more aggregation you add, the more performance you're getting, but the value of every additional aggregation is the marginal value is decreasing. So you have to decide how much memory, how much uh, storage versus performance you want to have, and that's a super cool we had, and that was really how, you know, the, the peak of the demo that we had today. But that was really what we built then. You know, we built that that uh, that system that allowed in a very economically compute permutations of aggregations. Uh, and it was very fast and very scalable for what it was doing at the time. And that was the all of server. That was at the heart of what we were selling. Um, we added to that the computation language that worked on aggregates, all worked on the multidimensional space we called MDX. And people still use MDX today. Um, so MDX plus the MOLAP store with a, with aggregation is really what made analysis services in the in the early days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I only started at SQL Server two thousand eight, so it's a little bit later on the the MOLAP engine. But yeah, definitely. So uh, and, and and then we became re really this powerhouse in the corporate BI world, right? Because I mean, I was there, and we were doing multi dimensional engines, reporting services on top. That was really. Big and Microsoft was really big. I actually, in, I had a brief stint as a Cognos Cube developer too, but I definitely preferred the easiness of the multidimensional. Now we say easiness of multidimensional engine. A lot of Power BI developers would say, "Oh no," but it was definitely more easy than uh, than uh, building Cognos cubes. But at one yeah, point, I, I think, yeah, I think I think that the the reason why it was so successful was several. Number one, it was really forgiving in the sense of you know, you, the, the fact that you could compute just a portion of the aggregation allowed you to have a lot of dimensionality. So you could just throw a lot of RBI at the analysis services and not worry about scale. Uh, so very uh, forgiving, very, very easy to use. One of the things that uh, I always loved is building 
these are experiences that are very easy to use and attractive. Um, and in fact, that's what we also built the Panorama. We actually built the front end as well. But when we joined Microsoft, we only did the back end. So I put my creative energies around making sure that everything is, is easy to use. Um, and even in the back end. So it was forgiving, it was easy to use, and it was bundled with SQL Server, and the price was right. And in an industry that was very, very high priced and complex and uh, required a lot of hand holding for every implementation. I think basically the first mass product BI uh, server, yeah. uh, mass, that, that was a, a great innovation and it sold like hotcakes. We were definitely at the front end of enterprise BI. And especially when we got nearer to like SQL Server 2008 R2. And then in 2008, 2009, it became a bit more clear that the market was shifting right towards self-service BI and other tools started to come up where um, people just wanted to install on their desktop and just get going, right? So when did you first start yeah, to that's that? The, yeah, it's, it's, we started getting this weird reports from people that we're selling and said they're running into troubles with uh, a couple of companies that would come in and within a week, we'll get in there, install, run a PLC, and get out with the full product. And so it's, I think it's so fast. It's really hard for us to compete. Um, by the time we configure a server and install and get our bearings, they're done. And I was really intrigued by that. It was kind of what, what's going on there? What are we doing wrong? What are these guys doing? And then mm -hmm. I, I mean, then this was the first time I was exposed to the whole idea of self-service that is very lightweight, doesn't installate self-servers, you can do the whole thing on the desktop, um, and it is like, like Clip, it's like Tableau, we're starting to get significant mind share and that ability to very fast get results without having to go through IT, without having to buy servers, uh, all through the, you, by, with the hands of the business is without, uh, I realized something very, very, very uh, transformational. And, and it started bugging me. I said, you know, are we just going to be left behind like dinosaurs? Like, are we just going to be this, the guy still rely on IT and it's very hard? And yeah, we can talk about all location and all the features, semantic that we have. We have things that we can talk about, but just attractive to these quick results that they're getting with other class of tools uh, that I I realized we, we cannot afford to just ignore it and stay behind. And this is where uh, we started a journey towards self-service BI at Microsoft, which was very controversial, very, very controversial. Um, yeah, so, because so it's, it's was it hard to sell? Like, because you had this amazingly good product that was like killing the market. And then you came along and said, okay, guys, we need to, I think we need to shift direction. Yeah, it, it wasn't hard to sell. I think to, to, to the uh, uh, credit of the people who were working with me on that is that they also kind of started realizing that there is, um, there, there's a real problem and that if we don't address it, we will become obsolete. So it wasn't hard to sell that we have to do something. I think that People didn't realize realize at the time how extreme the measures that we have to take in order to really compete, which is basically leave the old behind and start all over again. I think if they knew it up front, that if I would tell them, look, we have to burn this couple of billions that we had already and start all over again, just send me to the nuts house. You know, just say, you know, you're crazy. It's like, we'll never do that. I don't think we ever said it this way. Uh, and so they allowed us to run with it. Uh, we, but one of the things that you, you have when you, when you have this kind of challenge that we have uh, you know, realized that something is fundamentally different about how the other guys are doing things and what you have in hand is sometimes you have to have the, the courage to say, what I have, my technology is just probably not at all to address the challenge. And as much as I can, twist it into pretzels, it will never do it. And, and I can just hang on and hope for the best or just you know think fr fresh on this one. And we decided to go. We, we knew that the, 
the key to getting so the, the main difficulty of emoji um, in terms of the ability to compete with this new self service motion was the same pre aggregation that we talked about before the secret, the magic, the cheating of OLAP that it knows all the answers in advance. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of work to the data upfront. So you would read the data and you let the system work for hours sometimes to compute all these pre-aggregations. And that was the life. And it was okay when it was an IT guy doing it and they they you know they, they, they designed it, they planned it, they scheduled it. That's how it worked. And then you you you're looking at the business user say, well, business user, whenever they want to make a change, they do they understand they have to reread the data, recompute the data with all these aggregations wait hours. So they will never stand for it. There has to be a different way of getting the performance that is not designed, not revolving around computing a huge, you know, thousands of aggregations in advance. And this is where the in-memory computations came into place. We, re we realized that the secret, the reason why the self-service BI companies were becoming successful is because they were relying, instead of pre-computing in advance, they were relying on, uh, on, on the performance inside in-memory. And they were not trying to scale to those vast quantities of data. They were saying, well, we know that our users have smallish amounts of data, maybe medium size, but enough of it can, you know, there's enough memory technology at the hand that able to allow people to operate and work in memory and you get the performance of memory rather than the performance, which is the time you know, that was spinning disk at the time, there's not even SSDs. Uh, we're talking about a million to one real, uh, ratio in terms of the, the throughputs of disk versus memory. Then you can get so much performance out of memory that you don't need the pre-aggregation. That was really the secret. But for this, we have to abandon the core tenants. So if we're going with in-memory, then we have to abandon the core tenant of what MODAP was, which is pre-aggregation. We, we're going to have to a different to a and, and so we convinced we convinced the, the, the company that we need to go and build a in-memory engine. Didn't realize that we're really abandoning everything, all that thing. Again, we I think we're pretty yeah. crafty about it, that not to alarm too many people. Um, and the other thing that we knew that we're going to be in impression is going to be key. And we knew that we have to go and uh, use the column store, column store. And we didn't know anything about column store. We were just starting to get around and we're starting to build column stores. And um, it was not going well. I would say the Calm store, I was working with Christian um, who, who is now a engineer, work with me still, we work for almost 25 years now uh, together. And he was building that column store engine. And we were just not getting the performance that we wanted. It was really, uh, it was really uh, uh, frustrating because every time we're adding more and more, another feature, another capability, another Construct. The system would gradually become slower and slower and slower, and we just could not understand what we're doing wrong. Uh, it was just not getting us the, the kind of compression and performance that we were looking at, we're looking for, and uh, we started to doubt what, what are we doing? You know, are we really going to be successful here? And that was around the the holy days of two thousand and eight, maybe. That we that was the state, and then I flew, and I flew to Israel on vacations for the holidays. And on the way back, I read an article, um, a paper. The first, the first sentence or the first paragraph in the paper that had nothing to do with column story was talking about editions uh, of data, and the the first sentence said data is not distributed uniformly. In, in in the in systems, um, you know, and I and it stuck with me. I said, data is not distributed uniformly. I mean that there are some values that are more frequent and some values that are less frequent. And so there's nothing in the algorithm that that ever takes it into account. That that thought that we never thought about the idea that the data is distributed uniformly, um, and it just it just was sentence that was running through my head throughout the flight. And we got home, we put the kids bed and I went to bed and we all bagged and I could not sleep asleep and the, the, the sentence were running through my head and said there's something there and I just go out of bed 
and starting to say, this, let's really try to think of an algorithm that take advantage of that data is not distributed uniformly. And at 8 a.m. in the morning, when my wife wake, woke up and she, uh, she she stepped into the the kitchen where I was working on the right, you know, writing this for the a new algorithm, uh, she was saying, "Come here, weren't you in bed the whole night? And for God's sake, put on some clothes before the kids wake up." Uh, and and they'll, they'll forget about clothes. I I think I have the most amazing algorithm in the world for for calling stuff. And I, I tried to explain what the algorithm was, but that was still not ready to even to explain to, to describe. But I I came the next yeah, it was the weekend on, on Monday morning I came to the office and I told I told Christian, you yeah, know, we have to start all over again. Everything we're doing was wrong. We have to start all over again. There's a new algorithm I have. And Christian was like he was working for six months building the old algorithm and he was really upset and he went to our common manager and he said you know Amir is, Amir is really going off the rail here he wanted me to throw everything out and start over again I spent six months on it I cannot just do that you know tell him to stop uh, and my manager and Kamal uh, came and said you know Amir what's going on I said Kamal you have to trust me this is the most amazing thing in the world tell yeah, maybe one day I'll convince Christian. Uh, Christian said, "Okay, you have till the end of the day. We'll do. We'll build the base of the algorithm, and and we'll see if you're right, if it's if, if it's wrong or, or not." And he was willing to not until six p.m. We actually wrote the first day. We work until twelve you know, twelve a.m. before we run the first run, and the numbers were stunning. And Christian was saying, "That cannot be. There's something wrong. I made. I have. I, there, there's some bugs in the code." I said, "There's no bugs." You never have bugs. This is it. This is the deal. What you see here is a, is is this magical performance of Verdi back. We didn't call it Verdi back at the time, but this really was the, the start of the journey. This is how Verdi back came to life. And Christian is is one of the top developers at Microsoft. Like he, there's nobody like him. I think probably top five. Uh, it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. And he wrote in six months. He wrote about two million lines of code with no bugs. And what we got is magic, pure magic. It's like the first time I thought I wrote, we, we, we discovered something that defies, felt like it defined the laws of physics at the time. Um, we did demos and people thought we are actually fraudulent. We are, we are we're fraud, they said it cannot be. It's like you claim that you have a, a machine that is faster than the speed of light, that's how it felt like. Um, and it, and it was it was inconceivable the results that we were getting, but it wasn't. It was just a, a very very unique way of uh, working with data, compressing data, and have algorithm of how they work on the data while it's compressed. Um, and that's very the fact as you know it today. And I can tell you that when we were done with it, about the after a year of development and two millions of you know about two million lines of code, we said it's the first time in my life, and maybe the only time in my life, as I said. This is just perfect. We'll never ever make it any better. We can just seal it up and save it for eternity because it will ne there's no way to improve on it. This is as optimized as it will ever be. And for the most part, we are right. We barely touched it in the over a decade later. We barely ever touched the, 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 the core algorithm. We made, we made some enhancement. Never the core algorithm, the exact same core algorithm that we wrote in 2008. And it's still about an order of magnitude faster than any other column store that is out there, even though it's over a decade old. It's, it's true magic. It's absolute magic. Uh, and, and so uh, I think, yeah, I, I worked on a very, very cool technologies. I uh, a lot of patents and stuff like that. But there the back, it's a once in a lifetime thing. And so it's all about that one night sitting naked in front of the computer, computer and writing the algorithm. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine. So, okay, so we have the VertiPack engine. And then the next thing coming to it is like, okay, you're going to build a BI engine, so you need some calculations on top of it, right? So here comes Dax. Yeah. Another, like, I mean, we've, we, we know each other since like 2009. I remember you looking at my blog posts and that back then. and. Like, oh, wow, Amir is talking to me and like about these things. And like, to me, it was like really eye opening. The performance was one, but like Dax was really did it for me. So what were, what were the thoughts around that? Yeah. So, so 
we knew that, yeah, when we knew that we were going toward the service world, uh, two things need to happen. First of all, um, business users need interactivity. So they need, that's where we, the ability to throw away the disk-based storage and the aggregation that we prior to hours to compute and go for an in-memory model was, was really the, the motivation. So we all be active because memory is kind of set. We said, let's ex take Excel as the model. That was very, very explicit. We want to go sell service. We are going to go after the Excel users. Cell users work with memory. They feel that everything is interactive. They can go to any cell, change something, immediately the results. Uh, so we said that should be the principle we should be, we should be operating uh, with. And that's kind of what uh, uh, led us to the development of that in-memory engine. But similarly, we said, so to be an Excel user, Teaching multi-dimensional spaces is going to be uh, very, very challenging. And while this is uh, Jordan and, and who else? <laughs> uh, and uh, so, it's, it's, so teaching about about multi-dimensional spaces and MDX will be challenging. Let's try to stick to things that they understand. And the thing that they understand are tables. Yeah, they know tables from Excel. Many of them use also Access, so they understand tables. If they use Access, they also understand that there are relationships between tables. We, we we thought that that's a much more achievable uh, approach to to, uh, to to how to work with uh, uh, to introducing model for, for business. So if we we are going to move for a, a table based world with relationship between tables, it means that the old language, which was looking at multi dimensional spaces, is not appropriate anymore. So we said we have to have a new language. And the baseline was we start with simple expression. Though. So a lot of the scale of functions we have in language that we know now today is DAX is started to say, hey, let's first get all the functions from Excel. In fact, the way we did that, we went to the team and said, can we get the function like we have so we can just put it as in the heart of our language. We actually stole their code, not stole, but took their code and, and said that. So it's 100% compatible. And then said, so they'll say, okay, now we have to worry about the things that are beyond Excel, like how do we get relationships? How do we deal with aggregates? We still thought that the idea of a model, data model, just like we have in the multidimensional space that have measures in, with it, is a very, very, very valuable thing with the idea of a BI system without measure felt incredibly implausible to us. Now, to be very clear, other BI tools, also the ideal don't have, you know, we came from the world of multidimensional where measures were front and center. We cannot imagine a world without measures, and they did not, you know, because I think today it's becoming very apparent of how central measures are to everything. But, um, but we had to introduce a concept of measures. And really, this is, if you're looking at uh, all that and all the amazing power it has, and also all the things that people have to learn, is how you work with measures because the, the secret of measure that that defines outside the context of any specific query and then you can ask for them in any query and we just do the right, right thing realize how to compute themselves based on the other things that are in the query and so this kind of almost an inside and out approach to measures it's true for mdx it's true for dax that the measure looks at what's happening around it and realizes based on what's around it, what its value needs to be. That's a very, very different approach than almost any computation that exists out there that typically, you know, it, in SQL, you just tell any result how to compute itself. It's very, very procedural. It's a basically it's a run through the tables, scan row by row and aggregate this way, this column, aggregate this way, this other column. You basically give, create a program how to compute. And measures have to be defined outside the context of a program. It needs to be kind of on a standalone, logic, standalone logical island to just figure out how they compute themselves based on the things that are around it. They have this all in, own innate intelligence built into them. And that was hard. That, that's hard to, you know, that's, that's incredibly powerful. And it was powerful in the mobile days. It's powerful in that. But it's also requires people to get into that mindset of that measure that understand the context it lives in. That's everybody talks about how you really have to understand the filter context and the rotor context of measures. Uh, but that's what gives the power. And 
you know, you say, should, do I regret it? You know, did we make it too complex? Yeah, I don't know if I could have, you know, if, if you have to have them, if you have to have measures, I don't know if we could have made it so, so much better. Some people think that they do. I know some people say we could have gone more visual. Um, I'm not convinced. I think we can do better. You know, I think that we ways to simplify. Um, but no, I don't think I say I regret we should not have done it in any way. I think this is still the heart of what, what makes Power BI so much more powerful than any other self-service BI system is that very rich data model that is measure based. And yes, you have to buy, you have to buy the bullet. You have to introduce this non-trivial concept of a measure, but boy, the amount of mileage and power we get out of it is just unbelievable. Yeah, the, the things that people do with it, it's just <laughs> incredible. Yeah. All right. So we were very successful with it. We did the Gemini, we did power pivoting inside of Excel, and then there came this new thing, like Project Crescent, Power View. So what was the idea there? And how did we, because first we had Power, BI, power Pivot, that was the data modeling, working with data, but then something else started. And this was just yeah. around the time that I, that I started joining in 2010. Yeah, you know, when I joined Microsoft in 1997, in the first week that I joined Microsoft, uh, the, the, the person who led the acquisition took, came, who took me to the Excel and had me meet with the GPM, the group program manager for the Excel team. And that was the start of an amazing partnership we had with the Excel team, where Excel was the, the tool that was front and center in everything we do at, at, at NBI at Microsoft. Um, and it was great. And you think about the OLAP days and, and Excel had direct support to connecting to the OLAP cubes and you had cube formulas in Excel. And the world and all the BI world was Excel, you know, the experience in Excel was was you know, where like every product was supporting Excel, Excel was front and center. What happened was that with the new self service BI tool, not only that the results uh, you got results very, very fast and because you had this in memory processing. But they also introduced a different paradigm for how to work with data. It, instead of relying on the grid of Excel, they offered a whole new set of interactive experiences directly on charts. And, and users, you know what? Users like charts more than they like grids. That's a fact of life. You know, it just, it just is. And they were able to create this beautiful slice and dice experiences directly on charts. And suddenly Excel felt, you know, not up to par. Not that it, it wasn't so shiny anymore. It wasn't so cool anymore compared to the beautiful visualization with that work we had the tools. And we realized that we have to offer these uh, visual centric experiences rather than uh, grid centric experience of Excel. And we came up with an idea of how to offer uh, visual first experiences, and we call that, that experience uh, Project Crescent. Later it became, we named it RD, RD in Excel. Now, not a lot of pe people, if you are a user today, it's very unlikely that you have used BarView in the past. It's, it never got really to a critical mass of adoption for various reasons we can talk about as well. But the uh, if you ever look at the internet and looking for images for project for for Power View, Project Crescent, you'll find that they are very, very, very similar to what you to the experience that you have today in Power BI. In fact, Power BI today, Power BI, the first iteration of Power BI that we released as a standalone product, was taking that uh, in-memory engine with the DAX capabilities that we had that that the Verity Pack engine and with DAX capability that was showing up as an add-in to Excel called Power Pivot. And the other add-in in Excel that we had, which was the, um, the Power View add-in, Project Crescent, um, and take that one and package them together as a product. And to that, the third add-in that we had to Excel, which was the add-in that allows us to load data and transform the data, which was called Power Query. Take those three add-ins, Clump them together, I would say, in a very crude way in the very beginning, uh, and, and ship them as a product. And that was 
Power BI, to be very honest. I mean, now we made many other things we've done. Uh, we, we created, the, you know, we made it into a cloud service. We had a dashboard. We added the content packs. Uh, we've done a lot of, you know, really, really good stuff in addition to that. But if you look at the heart of the technology, it was our people, our view, and our query from Excel. Yeah. Pulled out into its own product. Um, and it was really amazing once you... Once you take it out and put it into its own product, and once you don't try to make everything about the grid of Excel, but you say, no, we're actually going to put that these visual experiences front and center rather than the grid uh, be front and center, you really do get a very, very different product. Uh, sometimes I think about it, what is the difference between what we had before and what what we end up with Power BI, what we had in Excel versus Power BI. I would say it's a little bit like, imagine that, you know, for a while, you were trying to convince the world that the best way to create presentation, to create slides, is just to use a word and just create the pages to be uh, landscape and just change the fonts to be larger and, and so forth. And, and you just say, I can do everything in Word. I can build slides in Word. Right? And that's kind of how the add-ins in Excel were. You, you say, you can do BI in Excel, just like you can do slides in Word. And the truth is, you can yeah. But compare that to, you said, no, I understand that creating slides is just a, you can create a fully optimized experience. So instead of trying to stick everything into that other product, it's all about creating documents. Let's create, let, let's just make the experience more dedicated around creating slides and you have PowerPoint. Uh, let's do the same thing with BI. Instead of making it all about the spreadsheet, let's make it all about the visual exploration, the visual formatting. Um, and, and the, the, the visual interaction. Uh, and that's without an amazing dedicated experience, suddenly say, oh, 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 wow, that's awesome. And that's how we got the Power BI desktop. Uh, so that's really what happened. Now, since then, so many things happened, like we've been releasing every every month, you know, dozens of features. And, uh, and it's not, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, today when you look, uh, to look at RBI today versus those three add-ins that we had in Excel, and you know, it's like comparing uh, a jet engine to uh, to a hot air balloon at this point, right? It's yeah. but it it all starts from you know, uh, all started there. So, what was the main reason that uh, we didn't continue inside of Excel? I think it was the realization that we'll never really get the experience right as long as we are. Uh, beholden to the Excel grid-centric ex experiences, was trying to take two experiences that are competing on the attention of the user, the two paradigms. Like we, we were trying to force Excel to have a split personality. Um, you know, every product has a DNA. Every product has the thing, the canonical experience that, that makes it all about, about like, it's the slide in PowerPoint, it's a grid in Excel, it is the document page in, in Word. Uh, you know, every, the thing that everything hangs off on, of it. And those, and, and the BI was just not suitable to hang off the grid of Excel. So we were trying and we created this, this you know, island within Excel, which was the Power View island and the Power Pivot island. And it just didn't feel like it belonged because it was not really, you know, it was like, the badge was rejecting the implant or something like that. It was just, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it just, it wasn't the right blood type. Uh, so that's one. The other thing I think was, it was clear to us in crisis mode because the other companies, the other SBI players, uh, were making rapid progress. They were, really, you know, um, they were releasing every year a new version and Excel was releasing was every three years about a new version. And Excel was taking sometimes three years to get deployed at customer sites. It's not like today, everything is much faster, but we're talking about eight, nine years ago. Um, so, um, so the pace of innovation we could achieve with Excel was the pace of actually customers getting their hands on top of the, on top of Excel at the time, which is not suitable for the, what we needed to do in order to become market relevant competitive. So to do this, do all, you know, the inherent uh, incompatibility of the user experience with the grid of Excel and the speed of innovation, innovation we needed uh, really led us to the logical conclusion that we need to have a standalone product. And the fact that we're standalone competitors and proven in the market was there just made the decision much easier because we don't have to will customer buy a standalone product? Yeah, they're buying the other guys. So let's let them have buy RBI. 
Yeah, makes, makes sense. And it's actually interesting to see, like we kind of diverged for a while, but now we're back in business with together, right? We love the teams integration and pivot tables and lots of, because we know there's many users that are using Excel and there's a lot of large user base who has Office installed. Yeah, so, so Excel is a bit, Excel is amazing. Excel is by far the you know, one of the most uh, most amazing tools products in the world. And and I know that so, you know user satisfaction of Excel product is uh, is probably one of the highest uh, satisfaction rates of any other business oriented product in the world. Like users love Excel. There's no doubt about it, and and I always love the Excel team. They're, they're made out of amazing, amazing people that are serving a huge crowd of hundreds of millions of people. Just I just imagine that the the weight of the responsibility on their shoulders and make, try to make right and perfect the experience for all their users. Yeah. Um, and and, they, and they, they screw up. Like consequence enormous. Um, not not so, break that investment bank. <laughs> and so the. Um, so there's 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 no doubt that Excel users need data. They need great data. They want to analyze data, but they want to do it in Excel. Way. Excel said Excel has its way. It's a very good way. So if you did how we bring BI data into Excel, is not by telling users abandon the Excel way, go to the Power View way, Power Pivot way. We just say no. You can stay. You stay in the grid, and you do pivoting like you've done. Do you know write formulas? You've been writing for, for forever. But use all the formatting that you used to. All things that you love Excel, but now it's just connected to data that is high quality coming from the BI system. So the integration we have today with Excel is the right integration. The integration that preserves the DNA of Excel, preserves the the core experience of Excel, but just it makes the life of those Excel users so much better. Yeah, makes total sense. So. Maybe you can ask you too, like, what do you think is the secret of the success of Power BI, of Power BI today? Because we are very successful. You, you look at the magic quadrants, you look at, like, it's everywhere. Look, I think Power BI has, you know, there's no one thing that you can say made us successful. I think there, there, there's a combination of things. Um, I think it starts. At the very beginning, it starts with uh, humility. And I would say, in some way, we were almost humiliated. We were the big guys in the early 2000s. We had the, the big servers that everybody were buying. We had the multi-billion dollar business with, B, with, with BI. And then came the small players and almost destroyed us. Like, we got it wrong. Like, we, we did not... Uh, you know, we, we we started losing relevancy in the market, and we it was crisis mode. And when we came out with Bar BI, we knew that we have a lot to prove. That we have to redeem ourselves. That we were you know we screwed up, and we have we cannot act like we are the big dogs anymore. We have to act like we are young, we, we are the upstart, and we we are going to fight the big guys. They were the big guys. We are now the small guys, and we have to go and use small guys tactics. And small guys tactics is, you know, I, I'm, I'm a military, I, I've served in the military, so I want to sometimes use military, uh, yeah, mil, military uh, 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 metaphors. But when you are the guy, when, when you're the small guy and you're fighting the big guy, then you look, you know, then, then surprise and agility is how you win. You, you move fast, you strike fast, you never stop, you always confuse what everybody else. And that's what we, you know, that's what we've done. We just start to release every month, like it was unheard of. Today, the industry, you know, like remember, Harp was releasing on a three year cadence, cadence on a regular basis. These other guys were re releasing on, the, on an annual cadence, sometimes 18 months cadence. And we came and said, well, you want to release the service once a week? Fifty times, three times, uh, times, times a year, and the and the desktop once a month, twelve times a year, and we're going to just pack, jump back it with more and more features. That's one thing. So just move fast, improve, improve, and you're constantly overwhelmed uh, with action. Number one. Number two is we know that we know. We'll ask the community to to uh, to help us, and we'll, 
And one thing that was the most amazing thing that happened is how the team transformed its spirit from a team that was uh, sitting in its ivory tower in Redmond and thinking, you know, thinking that they know everything to, uh, and, and, you know, talking to customers from time to time doing customer visits and conferences to a team that was removed all the barriers between itself and the community, started engaging directly on Twitter, directly on the blogs. Every comment was answered, allowing the community to offer features, to vote on the features, and the team took the cue directly from the community and just and hold them accountable. The community want. Sorry? And hold them accountable. Yeah. And exactly. hold them accountable. And, um, and that... Breaking of the barriers between Power BI and community was amazing, energizing both for us and for the community. The community felt for the first time they have a huge say in on, on the roadmap of the, of the product. The community felt empowered, um, and the community felt that what you know that we're taking it seriously. We are honest with them. We are directly interacting with them. They could make yeah. That we will converse on 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 the social media. We'll converse on the blogs. We'll converse with conference um and they felt i think this is the first time that the community felt that they were a virtual part of the product group. uh they were not just our customers they were part of the people who drive the product forward and what that was crucial that was absolutely crucial in the, what the, the role of the community here because in the early days and stuff nobody sold power bi this is kind of the, the the problem that you have when you have a small product company um it's very hard to get the people who sell product company to pay attention to a small product that has no revenue, no idea by any kind. Why would they take time on it? They can go and sell some, you know, blockbuster, have a million dollar deal selling off and so forth. Why would you know? Why, why do they have to go to the, the rough patch uh, of, of of trying to convince customer to bet on an unproven product? And so. And that's kind of a challenge that no startup has. Startup can go and say, I, I'm small, but I can hire five salespeople and my product that will be dedicated. They'll do nothing else to do but sell my product. We, don't, we didn't have it in Power BI. There was nobody who was dedicated to selling product, uh, Power BI for years. years. There was not just nobody selling Power BI for years. So the only way Power BI was, was, was distributed and selling was through viral adoption. And for the community, downloading the product, realizing that is something really cool about it, realizing that we are actually wanting to engage with them and work with them, and they became they became believers. The community started spreading it within the organization, getting viral adoption, and that's really what led to the success. So I would say there is absolutely the community engagement, uh, that promotion that we had, and, uh, that, and everything around that just make it super easy to adopt. We call it the, the uh, five by five that, that every new user that comes to the product you know, is going to get within five seconds they can sign up and within five minutes they're going to get a wow and realize how cool the product is uh, for them. The moment we uh, you know we start thinking this way, you know frictionless adoption, all viral, all community driven um, then the fact that we were very mature in terms of features meant much less because the other thing is the community Communalizing that, even sure, that was kind of where it was that no, well, no, even if we don't have a feature, you know, by the door, the feature could be there. It was just vote for it, you know, and um, and that very rapid innovation got us a lot of credit with the with the community, with the customers that people say, yeah, we know that we don't have all the features, just, but we just look at the trajectory of of the of an enhancement that you're having, releasing every week new features, every month new new desktop release. Uh, we believe you're going to get it, so we'll, yeah. we'll we'll just we'll just we'll just give you a chance, and and I think that that's really led to it uh, to you know that, that to this product that fast innovation, community engagement, and also a great price point, and uh, and that's kind of how. Uh, so uh, that's a story. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So actually, and now we're kind of back right to the beginning because we were starting as self-service. And now we see a lot of organizations are ingraining, Power BI is ingraining into those organizations. So now 
we're back to enterprise. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that it's, you know, everybody knows it and people forget it all the time, that in the technology industry, especially in the software industry, everything that is old can become new again. You know, uh, I, I remember having discussions about how relational databases are dying because of Hadoop and Spark and who will need the relational database anymore. And now you look at how hot all this area of you know, data warehousing with relational schemas and SQL language. And yes, the technology is different, but uh, but it's really, think about it, it's really, we're going back to the same old, you know, data one that we had 40 years ago, making a comeback. You know, it's, a, of course, everything with it, you know, New underpinning technology, but uh, same happens with BI. You say self service is awesome. Who needs IT? But then you realize, of course, people need IT. IT is not going to go away. It's, it's, it's fulfilling a very, very important function in an organization. They're making sure that things are safe and things are healthy and things are compliant and things are authoritative and things are high quality and things like who will take care of that? Business users don't have the power or even the mission to make sure all. All these things are true. So any, any organization, any startup that says, we are all about empowering business users and we are all about making them uh, um, escape the clutches of IT and IT is the enemy and business users are the winners and we'll make, we'll free the end user from the, uh, from the guys in the IT department. They really, they really don't understand the way of the world that there is a balance. There's a balance between empowering business users and making sure that the organization's imperative, organizational imperatives are being secured. Uh, there are limits of what you can expect business users to do, and there are and some things are bigger, and you need professionals to do them. And just not say, hey, let's open Home Depot so we can have people do it. To do it yourself, it means that we don't need builders to build houses and skyscrapers. Now you're going to get, you know, people do it yourself skyscrapers, right? You need yeah. both. You need the professionals, and you need you need also the do it yourself. Both are important. You cannot say it's one or the other. And I think one of the things, you know, we came. Remember, we started with SQL Server. We were all about the professionals, the the, the, the true IT guys. And so we sold server. The cell service guys came and they're rallying, forget about IT, we can do everything, you can do everything yourself, do it yourself. We, since we came from the world of the IT guys, we never forgot, for, we never, never, nobody had to explain to us how important IT is in the equation. So even when we came out with something that was very, very easy to use, we were very, you know, with, with Power, Power BI desktop and the Power BI service, even Power BI, and, and, and Power BI, we always knew that there has to to be a balance there between uh, the business and IT. And even if for, for a short while, we'll just talk about, everything we're talking about is going to be about the business users. It's just going to be for a short while because he will win and you need both and you just cannot ignore the other side. So we built it on the same technology that we built uh, that, you know, that came from the world of IT, the same analysis services, the same reporting services. This was the heart of the technology of Power BI. And even if we did not expose all the power and complexity that comes with that stack, and we really made good, did a good job of hiding some of these things, the user can easily adopt Power BI. The power is still there, still lurking behind underneath the surface. And when we needed to go scale, IT said, look, Power BI sounds interesting. Users are loving it. Can we use it for IT? And we just came in, of course you can use it because you were using analysis services before. It's the same technology. Yeah. Using the reporting services, the same technology. You can just you can trust us. You built massive systems on the same technology before. And that's mass adoption by the IT because the very technology was baking for 20 years and so on, that was had a massive proven track record. We never abandoned those that, that approach. We never abandoned that technology. And we're now sitting in a fantastic place of combining the ease of use of service and the amazing power that IT needs for scale and governance and all in one system. And I don't think there's anybody right now in the market that can provide the dual the duality of the value that we provide because if you came from cell service only like some of our competitors there's so much catching up for you to do to to really satisfy the needs of it in terms of scale complexity compliance security and so forth um and if you came from 
if you get from the IT time, you know, you don't have the ease of use, you don't have the empowerment of business users. So we are the only one to read that that balanced proposition. I think that today, absolutely the the thing that drives the mass adoption of Power BI. I think if the first two are all about community and viral adoption, the next two, three years are all driven by massive rollouts of IT that just love the fact that we can balance user empowerment with security, mind scale, governance, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, that's really the, 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 the really amazing thing that we can do with Power BI is even the features that we don't even create ourselves, right? It's all AD and it's all uh, MCAS and the security features. And like that is also no one has that. And that is just mind boggling. And, and, and that's it. If you, we, we, Power BI is winning. It really is the best of breed for sure. But boy, it sure helps to have such amazing company to support that with so much technology that was built by other teams at Microsoft, whether the AI and ML technologies in Azure, whether it's the uh, additional databases in, in SQL, whether it is the identity in SQL coming from the AAD team and from the Microsoft Information Protection and Advanced Protection, uh, with Office, with its connectivity and with Teams. Like we have such an amazing set of services that surround us and help make Power BI not just by itself great, but even much so much better when you look at it in, in the context of the broader Microsoft ecosystem. And we're just so grateful to be working with this amazing company. Yeah, makes total sense. So maybe the last question. Uh, we already talked about some amazing things. Where do you see it going from here? What are some of the next, what, what does the next few years look to you? And not just us, but what is our biggest challenge in the industry? Look, I, I think let, let's let's really go five years forward. Five years from now, the use of Power BI in businesses will, will be the same to the one that you see of our or Excel, the same order of magnitude. Within well, not that far off. Maybe five years is maybe even it's too far away. But we are talking, about, I know the numbers. I know what is the monthly active use of those products, and I know where we are in Power BI. We're not there yet. I don't know that far off. She look at the growth rate and extrapolate it and years forward and say, yeah, Power BI could be just be as as well known, as popular, as as a verb, uh, as PowerPoint or Excel is in, in business. Where that's really the, where we want to be. We want to become one of those fundamental technologies that everybody knows, everybody uses. And if we can get that, then we can really realize the dream of a data culture because it's just like everybody, everybody knows how to use, nobody goes to PowerPoint classes. Nobody goes to Word classes. Nobody goes to classes. It used to be like in the 80s, 90s. But today you just, you just grow up with the knowledge. We want BI to be one of those things that you just grow up with, just like you grow up with Excel. Uh, and this happens when you get to this level of, ma of, of critical mass of adoption that basically people expect that when you join a workplace, you already know those things because everybody else knows them. And that's really where, you know, if we can get to that level, then we really will achieve the fact that it's a data culture, that everybody is using data, everybody is familiar with data, can read data, can analyze data, can edit data, relay data, uh, and basically, they, we are we achieved. I would say absolutely. We achieved today at Microsoft, RBI, uh, a data culture. There is not a single meeting that I'm attending where data is not front and center for every decision we're making, no matter what decision about what features to build, decisions about uh, a, you know about well priorities, about campaigns, about uh, how to improve retention, uh, how to improve satisfaction. Everything is data-centric. There's almost nothing that is not data-centric uh, that, that we do. And that's, I think, how the world should work because when you work on facts rather than opinions, you just get so much better results. Uh, and, and that's the other thing, I think, that the secret to success of RBI, we were so data-centric in everything that we did. Um, and so that's really the future. So I think, so how do we get, how do we get from this, this area that is, is it's BI, 
that is working today, Power BI, to really expand into the broad population, mass adoption that the rest of the office product enjoy. And I think you'll see a whole set of initiatives that we have and the integration we're having with teams, the integration we're having is just the people of the iceberg. You see more and more, you'll start seeing BI experiences showing up everywhere. You want everybody to start getting familiar with that paradigm of visual exploration, with the time of sharing of data. I think that you'll see that happening everywhere. And so that's, that is a, that is really the long-term uh, mission that we have. And that's really where we're heading. There are lots and lots of way stops and a lot of things that we have to do in order to keep on, not just add more new users, but also make the users that we have even more successful and, and uh, offer them a new innovative capabilities in the product. Uh, so I think, yeah, we're having our uh, annual conference, the Microsoft Business Application Summit, and bus, uh, in about a month or so, just over a month. Um, and I think you'll see some really, really exciting things happening, you know, showing up there as well. Uh, and I know the roadmap, and I know it's not supposed to disclose it. There is amazing stuff coming down the pipe, not in the long, even in the next month, uh, that, that people will gaga over. But it's all. It's all aimed eventually to getting to be make Power BI as a, I would say BI data, not even product, just the notion of BI and data be something that is ingrained in everybody's life. Is everybody is just learn it when even even in grade school uh, that they come to the workforce train. That's everything at the end of the day for that mission. Because when we do that, we just make the world better. We make the board. The, the, we we make people more objectives with their decision making, more aware of the surroundings, more optimal in their actions, preserving uh, uh, preserving resources, uh, getting the most value out of every resource that they have, uh, and making the planet better. That's pretty awesome, and I think with that we're we're at the end of the time. Uh, I think I've gotten some. Even I learned some new things about the beginning of uh, Power BI. Uh, and it was pretty amazing to hear from you. So I would like to thank you a lot, Amir, for spending the time to talk to us and uh, talk about the beginnings of Power BI and also where we're going. So, uh, yeah, thank you for for your time. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure. Have a good one. Uh, thank you. And that concludes another episode of Cast from BI. I hope you've learned a lot. So if you want to hear more about these uh, stories and diff different discussions, Hit the subscribe button so you always keep up to date with the latest and greatest. And if you like this episode, please hit the like button. And with that, I want to wish you a good day, and I'll see you next time.